Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, genderidentitytoday.com. This content is brought to you by subscribers of genderidentitytoday.com. So if you're already a subscriber, first of all, thank you so much for your ongoing support, because you know really dang well that subscribers not only receive new content directly to their email inboxes as soon as it publishes, but they're also able to interact with every contributor directly, which does include me, and I can't think of any reason I wouldn't want to interact with me. So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and written articles by me and the rest of our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today I am extremely honored to welcome Neil Laird to the show. Hi, Neil. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. Thank you for showing up. It, it took, what, eight weeks, I think, for us to Half of the summer, I believe, back and forth. We both in <laughs> right. Quad, I know that. And then, you know, we're both in places with dodgy Wi-Fi and in airplanes. Right. And stuff, but we all had to both land in the States before we could connect. Right. But I'm so glad. Let me do the rest of the introduction. I always do that. So Neil is a TV producer, a novelist, and an ancient history geek, which is awesome. I love that. Neil is also, before you go... Oh, is that it? Neil is also Emmy, I mean, like, that's not enough, but Emmy and BAFTA nominated as an executive producer, which, by the way, I just got to tell you, at some point I learned what an executive producer did, because you'd see that, you see it in credits, right? And you go, I don't know. So I learned what that is, and it's like, you pretty much do almost everything like you have your finger in almost everything. It's it's a, it's a huge part of of that. So... Emmy and BAFTA nominations are not, you know, anything to sneeze at. But why, why Neil and I connected, Neil has seen firsthand in, in doing um, the shows that he has, that he's, that he's produced, how the LGBTQ community existed before our modern Western society has somewhat stigmatized it. And, and that's exactly what I'd love to talk about today, Neil. So... I always love to ask like a question to like, let's go back to young Neil Laird when you were just a child back in the old country. I don't know what that means. What, I mean, obviously if you love history, what kindled this love for history? Why is that so fun for you? Yeah, I mean, it certainly wasn't when I was a kid. I was a big movie geek um, watching all the great epics and I love myself a good, I, I like looking past in the past rather than the future. I never like sci-fi and stuff, but I always like, give me seven samurai or Lawrence of Arabia and I'm hooked. I can watch those films and have dozens and dozens of times. So when I got out of school, a uh, high school in small town outside of Pittsburgh, I said, well, let's be a filmmaker, right? I mean, you know, how hard can that be? We find out later how hard it is. But so I went to film school in Philadelphia and I went through all the prerequisite ticking the boxes. And then I graduated with my, you know, valuable bachelor's of arts in hand and went to New York City thinking I would become Martin Scorsese or David Lean right overnight. Like you do. Yeah. Like you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the poor sod. But when I did get work, I was the poor sod, like holding a walkie talkie on some grip truck at two in the morning in Queens so they didn't sure. steal it. You know, and, and we're not talking about working on like Goodfellas here. I, I think my first film was Toxic Avenger three or four. I can't recall which it was. Whichever one was worse was the one that I worked I, on. No, but both of them, I'm sure. Both are, are down dog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyways, I became rather disillusioned and I lost the time to do nothing. So I started hanging out at the New York Public Library because it was free and had air conditioning. <laughs> And one sure. day I took this book off the shelf about the early rise of, of, of humanity that I didn't know anything about. I went to a small Catholic school. So our idea of history was, you know, the four gospels. You know, <laughs> clearly you can go a bit deeper than that, which I did find. So I, I plucked this book off the shelf and bam, I, the penny dropped and I became enamored of ancient history and resolved to teach myself ancient history through free books in the New York Public Library. Wow. So this was not, gosh, I guess I thought this was a relatively young Pursuit. That sorry, that came well, out sounding wrong. But it was know, after college. So we're going back to this was the uh, I don't know when was this the late eighties. Okay. Yeah. So oh, old, I mean, old people not born probably listening to this then. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have ancient true. history myself. 
<laughs> you are if you wait if that's the case so i turned 54 this year neil so don't oh, enjoy don't. those next four years when you get to 58 it's all downhill that's not it's true. all I'm downhill like, yeah, all yeah. Right. and i'm loving it you know <laughs> 50 is a good time I, you know at this right i mean i hit 52 and i was like boy i can't wait for this to be over now that i'm 54 i'm actually very happy to be here so you know i don't know what else to say but so so you so you've done a ton of studying um I'm curious, you know, in, gosh, I want to say this in a way that doesn't sound extremely pissy to Western society, because we have the tendency, Western society, to to see, well, only Western society. In fact, for that matter, in the U.S., we kind of, you know, yeah. somebody will say, oh, yeah, didn't, did you know this about France? Some people in the U.S. are like, what? No. No, I'm American. Was France, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're right. Is that in, that's right. an island somewhere, right? Isn't yeah, yeah. It? Yeah. <laughs> so, so what is, I mean, I'm curious, just like, first off, what do, what do we frequently, what, at least in the U.S., do you see frequently misunderstood just about history in general, let alone ancient history? I mean, and then let's big, actually big want topic. that too. Yeah, you need, you know, longer than one podcast for certain. I think we're very insular. America is, is you know, talk of the you know, top of the walk or whatever the cliche is. So we don't have to worry about the rest of the world as much as, as the old country. And so growing, right. I don't know people that, I remember, you know, flying somewhere years ago, and I've been to some 70 country shooting and I remember I was doing a domestic shoot and I sat next to this lovely old couple. And um, I was going somewhere, I don't know, cross, cross country. And I just got back from Egypt or Jordan or something. And I, and I told them that and they hadn't heard of wow. either country. And I, have you traveled at all? And they said, we went to Epcot Center. And, and we really thought we've seen enough of the world. So we're okay. And they said it in a sweet way where they weren't, that they really thought that that was all they needed. They needed to walk around Western Europe and, and, and get a pork pie and, you know, some, some whatever else you can get, some, some escargot if they dare. And they're done. They tick that box. I think as America is very much a country that doesn't need other. They think they don't need the rest of the world because we're so bloody yeah. huge, you know, 3,000 miles across or whatever and separated by ocean. So if you lived in Belgium or Holland, you'd feel very differently about your neighbors. Here, we're isolationist. And I don't think I was as a kid, but I certainly didn't know much about the world. It wasn't until I started backpacking. I mean, that's what happened after I read those books is I got really tired of waiting around for Toxic Avengers 16 to crew up. So, you know, I cobbled together my, my few pennies and I, I disappeared to the Middle East and I backpacked for eight or nine months. And that's where my life started. That's where everything came. That's when I came back and became a TV producer and been making the hundreds and hundreds of shows I have ever since. Because a lot of it is domination, yeah. is bringing that information to people back here. It's not like I'm doing, I don't make it sound like it's some high and mighty that I, they need me to be edified. But the stories that I found were so engaged that I wanted to tell American audiences. So documenting TV was perfect. So much of television is babysitting, but yeah. when you have a factual show and you can learn stuff about the pyramids or about, I don't know, the, the, the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan or whatever I'm talking about, you open the brain just a little bit more. You do. So, what, I mean, what is the best way then to teach this? Doing it, I mean, like the first thing I always tell anybody is travel. I mean, travel is what opens mm. your eyes because it's easy to look at my films or easy to read a book or to watch a movie or a Netflix show that takes place in Japan. But if you have some on your bucket list, don't wait for things to be perfect. Just, I mean, if, no, if you can afford it, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not cheap flying to Tokyo or whatever, but if no. you can go, go. And I guarantee you, you will come back a changed person. If you open your mind up to it. And allow yourself to recognize you're in somebody else's culture and you're trying to understand how they think and how they work is endlessly fascinating. And I really wish more Americans would get the chance to do that. But I don't think beyond Epcot, they don't need it. Yeah. You, you know, this wasn't something actually I was thinking about talking about. But when so we went to Thailand recently. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would never have considered going to Southeast Asia had had I not done it for for surgery, right. and it was probably the most, it was probably one of the greatest experiences of my life, and I, I guess you know. So what I was going to say was that they're like I have a push pull relationship. I hate. I hate travel because I hate being away from the things that I know. If, you know, if I go, oh, I want to go look up something in a book, except I'm in Thailand, you know, now I can't do it. So I. I, it's that bothers me, 
And, but then I also go, if I get on a plane and we're also putting more stuff in the, you know, that gets into the stratosphere and, and, you know, from a, from a global climate perspective is travel ethical for lack of a better word. And, and I, and I don't know. And then I think back and I go, but Thailand was opened my eyes to so many new things to, to experience Asian culture was, I, I mean, mind blowing. I mean, life so altering. Different, so different than what you expect. Right. I mean, it's easy to yeah. you think you can prepare for something and you get there. And it's like, Oh my God, these people have a totally different culture. They don't need me. I am a visitor in their culture and just watch right. and learn. It's a wonderful way to recognize not everything is as black and white as we see it here. Right. You know, though, for what it's worth, too, I think also, especially coming from the United States, a lot of us have this idea if we go to it's, it'll say France again, because I know that this it happens a lot in France. You'll get somebody walks up and goes, you know, hey, can you can you where's your bathroom or something like that? And the French will go, hmm, je ne parle anglais. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Je ne parle anglais. I can't think of how it's said. But anyway, clearly, I didn't take French in high school. I took Spanish. But you know, they'll, they'll go, listen, we don't, you're not the only people in this world. We're not going to kowtow or like, what other stupid words right. can I use? Or kowtow, cuddle, let's use a cuddle. We're not going to like. And I think, and look, having been to France many times too, I think that's a cliche about the French, which may or may not be true. I think it depends on how you approach somebody. I only speak English. And, you know, I've been somebody come, because I mostly, because I, I struggle and try to learn some of the words that I'm there. But if you approach somebody with a recognition that I don't know the language and forgive me and excuse me, most people just want to help you out. It's, I've met very, very few cruel, snobby people um, in all my travels. Yeah. I think it's, it's how you approach them. And it's also how you conduct yourself. You know, when we talk about, I'm sure we're getting into gay culture and stuff. But when you travel in those places, I have to recognize where I tiptoe and where I can be myself. And not all of that is just strict homophobia, but yeah. it's also I'm in their landscape. And their mores and their and their respects and how they and their modesty is a different shade than ours. And we can't go in angry and say, well, I live in Brooklyn and I, I do what the hell I want. So I'm going to be able to do that in Mon Jordan, too. It doesn't work that way. I mean, if, if, if the worst right. case is, I mean, beyond any, anything violent, which wouldn't happen, just insult people. And why do that? Why, why be that kind of a guest? Right. Well, right. I th actually, I think that's one of the best lessons that you can learn is, is that you, you go somewhere else and you're like, wow, this is very different to what I know. And, and so I need to respect that because it isn't just, you know, people trying to be weird. Like this is a whole culture, you know, that predates us like thousands There's of years. <laughs> Right, right. I mean, like I've been to, to nightclubs, you know, where, where everybody's wearing, you know, everybody's all in black and lots more eyeliner than I'm even wearing now. And, you know, like, yeah, we were trying to be weird then, you know, so if somebody came in, if like some, you know, Georgia fraternity brother came in to Nocturnia in Atlanta, you know, I wonder if that's still around. I don't know. Anyway, it was a great goth club. But if somebody like that guy came in, he'd probably go, God, you guys are all fucking weird like what's you know what is going on i think we would all go well yeah yeah like it wouldn't have been a surprise well yes of course we're trying we're to be weird and it's a weird but one you go to another like culture and it's like that. if you yeah right <laughs> right you're the odd man out what the hell <laughs> but you go to another country and if you have that that attitude god all of this is weird it's like hmm once again, you're the odd man out here. So let's let's talk about this. What's weird about that? Mm -hmm. So way, way tangent. Way I told tangent. you there'd be tangents though, right? So. <laughs> Reel it back. Reel. <laughs> Free tangent. <laughs> so right, okay, here we go. Because I got a good question. Because a lot so so you've you've been um, filming a lot of a lot of uh, you've done a lot of work for for other, for like production companies, I'm, I'm using the wrong phrases, I'm sure. Network. BBC. Network. Right. Yeah. People, network. Thank you. So you, so you've done, you've done work for PBS and BBC and, and National Geographic. I know there are others I'm missing. Discovery Channel. Um, but I know that you've always wanted to, to study 
other aspects of, of where you're doing some of the some of the um, the work. In particular, gay history is a big mm-hmm. a big thing to you. So so why is that? Let me well, just start I, with that. Why yeah, is that? I mean, I think traveling as a gay man and being out for a long time. I recognize that other cultures are in a very different place. And and I also recognize going to the ancient world. I do most of my shooting. Egypt, I've, I've shot like a dozen films. Rome, Greece, mm. India, Mesopotamia, Iran, Iraq. You know, I've been to those kind of places. And a lot of those are much more conservative. Yeah. But when you go there, particularly when you look back, you look at the ancient cultures, we're talking the cradle of civilization, these places, you'll see that gay life in many ways is a lot more open and embracing then as it is now. Now, I'm not saying there was stronger law back then. I'm sure life was very difficult if you went back to like, you know, 1000 BC Egypt or whatever. You might be dead of dysentery at age 20. But you at least love who you want to love. And I wanted to tell those stories, which, of course, I couldn't for Discovery and History Channel. Not because the people who make them are homophobic. It's just that's not the audience, you know. So the people who make these shows are New Yorkers or L.A. or Londoners. And we're very much very open and liberal and and. and positive sexuality too but you have to make films for the masses so even if i saw a story about some ancient gay couple i couldn't incorporate it into one of my shows or if i did it was just scratching the surface um so i started writing novels and i'm writing novels and all my characters the lead characters are gay so the lead character jared who's very much me when i was young he comes out on his first shoot in ancient egypt and it's a time travel romp so it's not like a heavy duty it's neither heavy romance nor is it a serious diatribe or historical deep, you know, it is a light jokey book about a, a feckless TV crew gets swept into the ancient past to win an Emmy. And, you know, the first one they go to ancient I Egypt it. is by Ramsey, the great and his henchman. And it's kind of fun, but I get a chance to use all I have learned in my travels about gay culture too, all historical stuff. But then also there are gay characters that were hidden in the past and I couldn't do that in my films, but I can do it in my books. Yeah. There, there are many gay cult, um, gay characters hidden in the past. Some of them not even all that hidden. Because I mean, if you look at Greek or Roman culture, I mean, homosexuality was not a no. was no, certainly it's, not like it's a, like, no, it was it's very different. embraced and very open. And it's only really with the rise of Christianity to point fingers at it where it became decadent, um, where homosexuality, same sex of anything, became pagan and heathen a lot of that was to sweep away all the earlier religions but christianity was kind of the death knell for that enlightenment um one of my favorite places in all the world and one of the reasons that i want to tell these stories and i make them characters in my book is a place in saqqara which is a necropolis in egypt if you ever seen the big step pyramid it kind of it kind of go you know it's the oldest pyramid ever and necropolis is an ancient middle east graveyard it goes way back and this is like fourth or fifth dynasty. So we're talking four and a half thousand years ago, the pyramid age. So anyone who is buried there is the creme de la creme. They are, they sure. are being buried next to the pharaoh because they are elite and they have the, this top real estate. So anyone there is not just happenstance. And I mention that because there's a tomb there where I saw on one of my first uh, trips to Egypt called the Tomb of the Brothers, which is not really in any of the guidebooks. You have to kind of look for it. It kind of gets eclipsed by the, the pyramids and everything else. But the Tomb of the Brothers, when you walk in, you realize what a misnomer it is. Because it is a tomb from, again, about four and a half thousand years ago, of two men who were clearly in love. And they are not brothers. These men are arm in arm, nose to nose, which is the Egyptian form of kissing. The wall is festooned with frescoes of them in love, you know, fishing and hanging out. And just you see little wives and children in the back. So they must have been ticking that box, you know, for the program. Sure. But these were two men who were clearly in love. There's two sarcophagi there. And what makes it all the more profound is we know there were gay couples. But this couple obviously did in the full light of history and the Pharaoh. And everybody knew who they were. These are not right. these are two people cowering like it would happen under Christianity or even 20, 30 years ago. These are two men who are out and proud and were living together and got the best real estate in Saqqara. And then you jump to when this it was found, we discovered in 1964 by Egyptian and British archaeologists, and they called it the Tomb of the Brothers because they couldn't possibly imagine that they were gay. The homophobia is so much stronger now than it was then. There's even a theory yeah. by some twat that said it was that they were Siamese twins and the only reason they're next to one another is because they could physically could not 
remove themselves from each other. Oh, they're boy. bending over backwards in their homophobia to explain something which is right there in front of you. It's just love. It's just love. And it's four and a half thousand year old lovers who should be celebrated, not hidden away under a ridiculous name. Right. No, agreed. I, somebody mentioned to me too, <clears throat> and I don't know. I mean, I trust the person who told me, but there was, apparently there was a, a I wish I could remember the name of it. I'm coming into this story knowing like, fuck all. And maybe that was a bad idea, <laughs> but she said, <laughs> yeah, right. Alexander, apparently Alexander the Great, when he got to Jerusalem in order to, to, um, what's the word I wanted to use? Like to make it real, like he was really now the king. Mm -hmm. He went to a, a, a community outside of Jerusalem that was made up of primarily gay and transgender people because those were the oracles then those were the oracles they were the healers they were the they were the magical people the people who straddled this line of sexuality and gender and so alexander went out there to get blessed essentially is what it was he was given a blessing of of uh of authority a blessing of sovereignty and so this this is a like a like a known story and you know, I guess, you know, if you look at Christianity, they go, well, no, we've never had gay people. No, there was like a community right out of Jerusalem. Right. I mean, this was not, you know, not Alexander was like some wiki Christianity, thing. but the, I see the point is made. Well, it's just like, sure. Yeah, exactly. And, and look, and, and, you know, there's clearly were gay Christians and gay kings. You know, my gay videos that I do for TikTok, I look at everyone from Richard the Lionheart at Julius Caesar and everybody else and talk about But it's also, it's much more fluid then, too. It's only when you get into the more modern era where the name comes up, where we get slapped with the names we have. Back yeah. in then, there was no name for gay. And even in Rome, which is later culture, it was just, you know, who you decided to sleep with is up to you. Um, because it was so common. Eventually, you choose to live with them or live not with them. But it didn't have all of these qualifiers. They would probably laugh at our, you know, LGBTQ, ABCDEFGs because we're all keep trying to make it so inclusive. They went the opposite way. Everyone's included. And so, you know, and 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 I think that's just a wonderful thing because again, it's like I mean, there were, there were certainly would be re certain things you could do or could not do. So in Rome, for example, what position you had. If you were the top, you were more you were more masculine than the bottom, and some of those stereotypes go on. But beyond that, you could do whatever the hell you wanted to. And it's hard to imagine today that just being so accepted, so widespread accepted. But it's right there in the historical record, is it? Right. And so I mean, so this history, gosh, I, I mean, this is really important. I, you know, the only way I can say it is to get right. I mean, to be able to say this, this is where we came from. Cause you know, we, this is especially in, in the U S we go, well, we have this grand history of the people who came, you know, on the Mayflower and, and go back to, to Britain and being, you know, uh, persecuted by the British. And, but we, but we don't, there's like a lot of our history that we go and we just don't recognize that other part. Because if we say, well, a lot of our thought comes from Rome and from Greece. Well, well, how come not all of it? Why did this suddenly get obscured? Why would this have been obscured? Exactly. You're cherry picking the, the good bits. Our architecture is very Greco-Roman, but not our acceptance of sexuality. Right, right. And so that that obviously, you know, I mean, I wish we could address that. And I hope that's what ultimately what your work does. I am. Because, that's what the books try to do because they go back in yeah. the past because it's modern people going back. I've written three now. The first one is Egypt, primetime Pompeii. The second one comes out this October. And then I'm writing primetime Troy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there we have Achilles and Pat Patroclus, you know, who are gay lovers. And we all kind of know they're you know, mythological or not. They clearly, if you, if you read the Iliad, Although Homer never says they're gay lovers, even Agamemnon says, oh, those, those boys again, whatever. It's very clear these are two gay men at war. Two strong – Achilles, the greatest warrior of all time, he choose, chooses Patroclus as his lover. So it's been around forever. And so I want to bring not just those big characters into it, but little-known characters like these two brothers, quote-unquote – um, and just let people know that, you know, meeting the modern gay world with with the ancient world is a kind of a way to kind of bridge that gap and say a lot less has changed than we think. You know, there was a joke. There was a joke Eddie Izzard made long ago. I don't know if you know Eddie Izzard. Sure. Oh, OK, yeah. good. 
But there was a joke. You know, Eddie says that um, says says so. I'm from I'm from Europe, where the history is from, <laughs> and then goes on to say, you you know, in the United States, you hear people doing, um, you know tours that say we've preserved this to how it was over 50 years ago today and people go no <laughs> people weren't even around then 50 exactly. years ago amen time <laughs> <laughs> right we think of but see like if you say prehistoric times like we like that's not that long ago you know when we think about because it's written that we're talking about written yeah. Yeah, it's written work, prehistoric. And of course, humans were, you know, rising and I'm just writing a script right now. And we're talking about the when we migrate out of Africa. And that was 300,000 years ago. You know, we got to the Middle East where it eventually would become Egypt 150,000 years ago. So that's all before. So these were humans just like us. They just haven't learned to write yet. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, maybe their brains grew a bit and they, but they were bipedal creatures who did what we could and they were burying their dead and loving each other. So Right. I remember there's this documentary so years ago when I was a kid. I think it was um, David Attenborough. You know, he is a big naturalist in Britain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, And yes. he talked about it was his civilizations, and he started off talking about how old the Earth is. And he so imagine he said, imagine if the entire timeline of the world is one day. Yeah. So it, I think it was kind of like we're talking about when, when we arrive is like you know six p.m. or whatever. It is way at the end of the, the dinosaurs arrive at noon. So there's all this time yeah. even before we arrive where the earth is there. Humans and pre in history, 5,000 years is a long time for us because we live to be what, you know, 80, 100 years tops. But in the grand scheme of things, we're a new species. 5,000 years is nothing. Ooh. So why would we think that yeah. we're not like Julius Caesar or, or the, the two gay guys in Egypt or whatever? We're exactly the same. Right. Well, and I think that's the point. We... We see, we see 50 years is a long time. I mean, because now I'm capable of saying, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, I remember back. It's like a long time. A lot of shit's under the bridge at that point, yeah. <laughs> well, yes, but, but we think that but even the whole culture does. We, we're really focused on, like, what happened in the last two years? That if you say, well, you know, go back to the 1700s, people go, oh, well, the 1700s, did they even have a wheel? <laughs> right. like, did they have running water? Right. Could they speak? And it's like, hmm. <laughs> Right. And you're like, no, 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 no. Like, think of, that's the 18th century. Okay. Do you know any 18th century books? I'm like, well, yeah, of course. Okay. So obviously they had language, <laughs> printing press, you know, it's like, come on. But this is what we do. It's very hard for us to visualize, I think, any more than about 50 years back, particularly in the U.S., I would I think say. In the, I think, yeah, I think, I do think European Europeans have a, have a much stronger connection to the past, again, because they are older and they're just, I think there's more educated in that way. We don't have the history there. You know, if you, you live in England, you can be in Stonehenge in an hour and you can realize, well, bloody hell, my own backyard, there's a straight right. analytic stone structure. And it just reminds you of the expanse of time. But you have to be curious about it just by being tell, told that history is X old doesn't mean you're going to embrace it. I love right, history, right. ancient history, because of exactly that, because of the amazing things they did long back then. If you go to the pyramids, if you go to the Holy Land and you look at some of these structures, you say, oh, my God, these people were just more brilliant than us. How did they do this back then without X, X and X and X? I'm fascinated by that right. focus and that unity and that shared vision that allowed something like a pyramid or, you know, any any kind of ziggurat to be built. Clearly, you have to be of common mind and really be energized. It's not all just a whip. You have to have a society that wants to build a ziggurat. Okay? Oh, I'm my gosh, sure yeah. Not anymore. Yeah, no, great point. Great point. You brought up Stonehenge, and I was thinking about bringing that up because you said four and a half thousand years ago, and I went, well, that's a pretty long, day, long goddamn time. <laughs> but Stonehenge is dated to, you know, 10,000, 12,000 years it's ago. About the same. It's about four and a half thousand. It's about the same time as the pyramids, about 2,500 BC, which is the, the original? Yeah. Because, well, but because Avebury, Avebury's older. No, they, 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 it, it was it was the third century BC. So, you know, maybe give or take the same time as the pyramids. Now, if you go to a place a place called Gebel Teki, I don't know if you ever heard of that. That is an amazing mm -hmm. site out in, and they just found that maybe twenty years ago. It is like a oh. Stonehenge, but it's in Turkey. That goes back to ten thousand. No one knew that existed until they found it just a couple of decades ago, and it rewrites the history books. But Stonehenge, we kind of know from some of the artifacts. 
two and a half thousand years. But you think what's amazing about that is there was no great society there. We knew Egypt and Mesopotamia and those existed back then in the Fertile Crescent. But Egypt was sort of, a, but England was a blank slate. So what were they doing but in these huge megalithic structures? Something else was sure. happening that's lost. And that's why it still retains so much mystery. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, have you been to Stonehenge? Because I have not. Oh, but... many, many times. Yeah, I've shot there many times. Oh. Yeah, And I love Avery oh. more. Avery is actually is, is one of my Do favorites. You, it's just right. so much bigger, bigger. and, it, and it's, it's, it's a little even more mysterious. It doesn't have the, uh, the lentils on top, but it's just a huge... Mm-hmm. Huge space. And there's yeah. a wonderful pub right there. You can always get a drink at two and one. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, you know, what I love about Stonehenge, what I've read about Stonehenge, apparently, you know, after they put all the stones there in place, they've been moved a couple of times. There's evidence of them having been like, you know, like you had one guy come in and go, mm, no, okay, let's, uh, let's move this too. Oh, and so it's going to look much better over there. Was probably not for fashion, was probably for... <laughs> Two interior decorators. Maybe it was a gay guy's <laughs> house, a gay couple's house. That's what Ooh, I'm saying. <laughs> right. <a> southern view. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, no, switch these two around. And as long as we're at it, let's put a couch over here right, if we right. could. Some curtains, you know. No, but, you know, it's it's interesting because, I mean, this is, these are very clearly aligned with astronomical features, you know, Uh and so when we think of prehistoric, we go, oh, yeah, they had clubs and they were hitting each other over the head and saying, oh, you take wife kind of thing. But it's like, no, they, they were observing. They knew enough about the movement of the stars to put together really big rocks. I mean, like yeah. some of these rocks, I think now are, are it's, it's from Stonehenge. They're being guessed that they come from Scotland. Yeah, now, Wales. Yeah, no one really knows. I think I always hear Wales, but it could be Scotland. They the, the blue stones, and and they don't exist right. in um, what county is it? I so it's well, yeah, it's in Salisbury. The yeah, the yeah, city, the, yeah what around Salisbury, the plains, and you don't get them there. You get Wessex. I think it's Wessex. Um, okay. it's further afield. So that means yeah. they had to figure out how to bring them that far. Yes. And these are t- many ton stones, you know. Uh, they, of course, that's using. Means they were pretty you, darn bright. They, they, right. they, they were not, you know, it was not Ugg with his club. This there was engineering and 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 concerted effort to figure out how to right. float things down a stream or whatever it was. And to stand them up and to, yeah. you know, and even just to calculate where are you going to put these things? Because because that's how, you know, how often do, do uh, how often does a summer solstice occur? Like once. Once a year. Yeah, three days. <laughs> Right. right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry. Once a year. True. <laughs> they don't. They don't do it again in October. <laughs> right. So you better measure that right the first time. I mean, I would imagine Stonehenge took, you know, many decades to to build just because you're like, do we get that right? Oh crap. Yeah. Okay, we got to yeah. move yeah. it two yeah. inches yeah. over. Scoot it an inch further. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. And they're like, yeah, you got some guy like you know, ancient guy named Jim or something going right. yeah. another goddamn inch. Exactly. Are you for real? And it. <laughs> I don't even have the god to damn it. Come on, he's not going to come along for I another couple of hours. I last week already. I need help. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, in any event, I mean, I think these are, these are I, I think they're big problems because we look at history. It's, I'm going to say this in a different way because the Catholic Church, particularly the Catholic Church, suppressed a whole lot of history, right? I mean, it, to, to their benefit, because when you're looking to, you know, run run an entire society, it's best to, to help people forget that something better used to exist or different anyway, used to exist. But there's so there's been a lot that's been suppressed. Where is it going to go with this? Boy, I had a really good point. And um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not even sure if I want to edit this part out because everybody's going to be like, yeah, that's kind of an Amy it's thing. Like, you know, go down a path. And, they, you can make it a yeah, statement you know. question and it works. Right. No, no, no. So, you know, the, but we, we think, oh, there we go. I remembered it. Thank okay. you, everybody. I remembered it. Everybody listening, I got it. But, you you know, the Catholic Church will, will say, you know, really nothing existed before about the medieval era. Just nothing, because this is everything we know about science. This is everything we know about religion. Everything we know about history comes from about the time, you know, 1100, 1200, we're done. You know, there's there's nothing else before that. And so we cut off this very rich 
history of, of humanity. Cause I mean, that's a lot of time that you're just thrown out. There's more time before than after. Yeah. Here you're talking say a couple thousand oh years. Oh my gosh. Yes. Years. Yeah. 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 But we, th- so when we think of a thousand years, we go, there's no, like nobody really was around, yeah. you know, a thousand years was prehistoric times. And it's like, well, no, it was not. Yeah. And then it comes down to, again, cultural curiosity and literacy and understanding. And you can't yes. get people to read books or pick up a book about the rise of humankind, but they should, I think, because you never know how it's going to affect you. It just, you know, right. I, I love when movies come out, you know, if it's Gladiator or something, it takes people in the past because it reminds you that people were just like us, you know. So that's why I always loved the epics growing up when I was a kid, because they reminded me that was a civil war or ancient Greece or whatever. And that goes way back. And they're just like us. They're just like us. And I love I love that. I, I think we have so much information in the modern age. I want to focus my attention and time and stories on people that are long gone. Yeah. So to, so to turn that completely on its ear, and, and that was a great segue, by the way. It's almost like we planned that out. Yeah, yeah, we were. Because I, I was going to say, well, because if we look much, much more recently, because in our own community, the LGBTQ community, sorry, what else was there? A, B, C, D? Yeah, and it's all, it's all kind of alphabet soup there. You pick your favorite. No, I, I, know. I, re- I mean, recognize inclusion's great, but every time I look at it, it's like, I have to add a Z now. <laughs> you know... I, your your statement where you said we, we keep adding letters to be inclusive and it used to just be everybody was included, that yeah. statement hit me hard. I mean, like I mean, that easier, was... Isn't it easier if you don't have to that? You know, it's like... Yes. An age yes. we just are. And so my question was, I like I feel to a certain extent in our community, we, I don't want to say we obscure our own history, but we certainly... I think there's some revisionism. Um, certainly, there, there's adding symbolism that we that we may that may not have been there. Uh, even if we look at you know the sacred cows like the Stonewall riots. Mm-hmm. I mean, speaking of 50 years ago, you know, were people around? I mean, the Stonewall riots were like 50, you know, a little more than yeah. 50 years ago, and and I think now we have people who are telling these stories who may not really know them. So I guess my question, and I'm, then I'll stop talking. Do you think our community to a certain extent obscures our history? I don't know if we obscure it. I think we're just like any other human. You could talk to an Italian American or an African American or anybody else. And you, you repurpose the past for what works for the moment, I think. And I think Mm. we've been, you know, the good thing about being uh, queer is we're now been around long enough in the open that we can, repurpose our own history we're no longer just fresh out of stone wall is half a century on so of course we're going to turn people there into martyrs we're going to talk about times that were greater or worse and yeah. i think that's just humans i mean that's mythology i think and we all do that to some of this history action even mythology we look back and then suddenly a president that was not popular is usually popular you know or time period we think the 50s was wonderful and the 70s was all peachy and I lived in the seventies. I was a little kid, but it was just, just a, it was just a decade for me. So we just loved the nostalgia yeah. and re, and re, and I don't think anything wrong with that. It's storytelling. I think I think when you do it for nefarious purposes, when you pretend like it was something other than it was, then it becomes a dangerous thing. Um, but look, people are going to myth, create myths about themselves and about others, and Lord knows we've earned it. To get the, the you know queer culture certainly has earned it. We have there's, there's more shitty history in our past than there is good. I don't know. Is that true? I mean, I mean, what I'm saying is probably, there's probably, you know, if you, if you think about just going back to recently, the, you're going back to the fourth century, right? There's a long time where being gay could get you killed and stoned. Now, again, you go back to the ancient world before then, you're right. I mean, it's, good on, it's a question of numbers, but certainly the recent history, thousand plus years is, you know, just keep it to yourselves. And the fact that, yes. you know, I can only marry yeah. my husband in the last 10 years. When in ancient Rome, you didn't have to marry them at all. You just moved in with them. Yeah, it shows you that we've kind of taken several steps back. Um, so Yes. Yes. No, I agree. I mean, I, it was interesting. You said, you know, because because now now we're out and about. And I thought, but it's not that long back that we were 
always out and about, that it was like, just yeah, totally it was, normal. It was you're right. You're actually right. It's a good correction because there was a time long before you and I walked the earth where it didn't matter at all. Certainly in the last couple hundred years, yeah, it's, you know, people were being slaughtered just for who they even looked at in the pub. So clearly we have, I guess my point, we have many dark times. So if people want to look at, at Stonewall or they want to look at, some other benchmark of, of queer culture and make it bigger than it is. I think that's their right because we've, we've been living, you know, I, I, I luckily am too young to avoid it, but I know several people who died of AIDS in, in the eighties and they got it. And that was a mm. dark, dark chapter of a lot of people that didn't come oh, through. Yeah. So we've been through some shit. <laughs> there's no doubt. Um, yeah, there's no doubt. Claiming, claiming our identity though, I mean, I think it's important. I, I'm going to turn this a little philosophical because I think knowing the history helps you claim that identity. You know, I mean, when I, because I, I've, there are a lot of people I've spoken to are like, you know, I'm transgender, so I'm just going to be shit on for the rest of my life. And I say, but, but it used to be we were revered. If you look at the shamans, you know, if you look at it's shamanistic, uh, shamanic, um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> pra practices, you know, many, many years ago, a couple thousand years ago, we were revered. Like those were the people who had the Celtic fire in their head. You know, the people who who could channel both fem masculine and feminine, whether that was sexual sexually or right. whether it was through right. gender. That's what all. Yeah. We were powerful. You know, we were the we were the people came to, who we were the people other people came to for help for healing, for, for, um, for divination. And so I think it's really important. Like I per, per personally think it's really important when somebody goes, yeah, you know, cause I'm, I'm a transgender, I'm weirdo. I go, no, look at what you can do. Yeah. You can channel both masculine and feminine. And do you oh, know wonderful. how powerful how that is? Yeah. That is yeah. 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 To the, you know how useful that is to the universe, the, the grand scheme of, of, you know, the universe? That's important. You understand both and, sides of it. And I, I think now that was just... Embrace both sides. I mean, that's a gift. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's been so many times somebody has said, has asked me, geez, do you think it would be important? Like, what if my, what if my, you know, husband put on a skirt or something like that and went out, you know, and I, and I go, oh, shoot, if he will do it, go do it. Cause really see what that feels like. You know, see yeah. what it feels like to be treated as a woman, you yeah. know, cause it, cause it doesn't feel great. You know, yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, I will all, say exactly all the hate this out there, but conversely, it feel rewarding too. And look, I think you can extend that. I'm, I'm not transgender obviously, but I am gay and very out and proud gay. And even just being gay in a same sex relationship, you can flip those genders. One yes. day I'm the woman, yes. one day I'm the man, whether it's in bed or whether it's sitting on the couch. Right. And those stigmas are not weighing heavy on it. So that's another wonderful thing about right. a same-sex relationship where those identity roles of gender go away. And so yeah. I know I don't know it to the degree that you know it, but I certainly feel what it's like to say, oh, and I, I, the feminine is, 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 is out of me, is in, in me today. And I'm going to expl explore right. that rather than something else. And right. what that, that's why I say it's a gift because you can, you don't have to worry about those labels. Right. It is a gift. It is a gift. And I, I think that's where, where people newly out people or guys, what, what is the phrase we use now? The egg cracked kind of thing, you know, people <laughs> who, who newly recognize, yeah, it may only be a transgender thing okay. for what it's worth. It's for what it's worth. Like I think back to, I was probably four or five years old and I'm like, why are people treating me differently? You know, and I know it just seems like something that was really common my whole life. But so the idea of an egg cracking and suddenly going, Oh shoot, am I, Oh, I guess I'm transgender. Huh? Like just seems, <laughs> seems right. odd to me, but you know, same was same with being, with being pansexual, mm -hmm. you know, Ultimately, I, I get put a label to it, and I went, "Well, that's at least nice that I can put a label to this." Yeah, it does help. But that was well, all it know, was. You know, so there's know. a label, you know, the good side about a label. The downside, of course, it does sort of like confine yourself. But the label means you can accept mm -hmm. it. There's people out there would accept you as pansexual or, or, or transsexual, right. or whatever else you want to be. Where before it was kind of like didn't even have a place to go. So why I'm not crazy about the labels? Yeah. 
positive side is that people are accepting you. Oh, you're okay. You're, you're transsexual. Welcome. You know, and the, you know, so right. I think a lot's happening there and that, that's great there. And I think hopefully it becomes so non, you know, hopefully it becomes so mundane and commonplace that people just look the other way. That's my hope with all this. Right. Kind of stuff. I thought that was gay marriage but, and I, I got married straight away. My husband and I were together for 15 years before then. Cause I think it's going to be taken away and still could, you know, under, mm. you know, you know, political situations, you know, knock on what hasn't happened. But I do think by and large, people don't really give a rat's ass <laughs> at the end of the day. It's kind of like, yeah, you be you. What I got other big problems. I can't afford milk or gas. You, you sleep who you want. Right. You want to marry Carl, you marry Carl. And, then, and that shows you that there's more fear than there is, you know, there's more fear of fear than there is actual fear. Once it's out, it's like, oh, yeah, whatever. Yes. Oh, gosh, that's so true. I think that's so true. Do, you know, there was, one little, there was one little bit I wanted to follow up on. I forget your exact verbiage, but you said something about it was being different. And in um, at, at least like uh, uh, Welsh – Mythology, so Wel- Welsh and, and British uh, mythology, Irish. The the word that they use, because you know, if you if you were to anything that was magical came from the other world. That's mm-hmm. you know the, the term that was used, the other world. And so anything that appeared sort of magical was other. So you could say, you know, if you look right. in, in mythology, like the you know, if you if you knew you had, yeah, you like you knew if there was a white dog with red ears. <laughs> That's you know right there symbols of symbols of the other in some way, which incidentally Thomas Tryon, uh, do you remember that actor Thomas Tryon? Mm-mm. Okay, it was like 1970s. He wrote a book called The Other. Okay, it's two twins. If you uh, if you want like a freaky book, read that one. He also <laughs> has another one called Harvest Home. <sighs> that one was a real. Anyway, point being that it used to be the word other was like a, almost a badge of pride. You know, if you were a fairy queen, you were other, and that was good. People go, damn, a fairy queen, what can you do? If you had the, the white dogs with the red ears is a big one. White horses, you know, white stag, white and red were big because, you know, the British and Welsh thing, the Saxon and Welsh thing, um, I mean, the Saxon and Britain thing, I guess. So... Anyway, I mean, th- there were there were indications of other, and now, right now, we give off indications of other, and I think to myself, people should be dropping at my feet, right? Oh, look at you, you're other. <laughs> the age of the other, right? How come nobody's dropping at my feet, Neil? That's my question. <laughs> you got to talk louder. That's all. That's what the that's is what that this answer? podcast is for. You get the word <laughs> right. Out. Here I am. I mean, yeah. other too, I, I, mean, t- I was thinking other too. My husband's black, and he always kind of rolls his eyes, say other. You're like black, because I was like, you know, I can't fit the other. Oh, you're 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 too much of a mishmash. You're just you're just a melange. So we just give you the other box. So it's <laughs> etc. It's like etc. <laughs> right. Well, and so now we think, well, if you're not pure blood or pure whatever, like that's a bummer. It's too too bad for you. No, other is great. Yeah. Like when you go, yeah, you got two boxes and then it's like, eh, I don't fit in. Like, yeah. that's good. That should be good. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> anyway, we have danced around a little bit about your Primetime Travelers series. And, and before, because we're starting to run low on time, but I want to hear more about this. Because you tell, um, you're telling history, but it's it's in fiction and it's also comic. It's also comedy. So what what do you... How, how are you trying to, to end up telling the stories as they are within that framework? Well, I use, yeah, I mean, I, I like comedy at this, you know, I, I do in the books because a lot of things I couldn't do in nonfiction. I couldn't kind of make fun of it or, or create characters or time hop and all the fictional stuff. And so I find my True. voice is very kind of light and I want to make something entertaining. The book is more Indiana Jones than it is or Neil Gaiman than it is, a, you know, a heavy duty outlander or some... Um, some some uh, high fantasy kind of thing with witches and dragons it's but it's my it's based on my life as, as a tv producer and i get a chance to go to these places and imagine them as shiny and new for the first time so like the second book that comes out i can use gay people that i've met so the first book i mentioned that talk about the tomb of the brothers the, the real guy's name neon and Kanum, are characters in that book and the second book i look for forgotten characters, gay characters in the past or names or whatever. And I make them 
part of the book, create total fictionals. So for example, Crime from Pompeii, which comes out in October, the sequel, I got that idea because I was traveling in Pompeii. I went there to write and I ran a little villa in Sorrento near the ruins for a month. And I'll just wander around the ruins every day and take notes. And there's this amazing set of uh, plaster cast out front. Have you been to Pompeii? No. No. I Pompeii, wish. You, know plaster, you know what the plaster cast are in Pompeii? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're the, the whole, you know, for those who are listening and don't know, they're the hollowed out bodies of the people that died in the, in the, in the eruption of 79 AD. And there, when you go into the, uh, the main entrance, there's, there's several of them behind glass. And one of them is called the two maidens, the very similar story. The last one I told, and it was, it was two people holding each other tight. And they always considered it was a mother and her daughter. There's very much an, an embrace. It's their last second before they died, um, which is probably a horrible, terrible death of pyroclastic flow, but they held each other tight. And they did some CAT scans and DNA tests a few years ago and found out that not only were they not women, they were two men that were not related. The, the DNA really? test proved they were both male, they were not related, and they were both between 20 and 40 years old. So they can't be father and son, theoretically. And the way they're holding each other, they sure look like they're two lovers. Now, we can't prove behavior, you know, 2,000 yeah. years on. But I looked at that. And that's where it clicked for me and said, I want to bring these guys to life. I want to tell the story of what a gay couple was like in, in ancient Rome in 79 AD. So I walked around and got a bunch of interventions I could about other villas in Rome. And I found, found my two embracing lovers. And I wrote the story there. And then my crew goes back and they videotape it. And they're making a show for a Discovery Like Channel Network. So I have the modern day world, the two gay characters, the camera woman who is a black lesbian from the Bronx and Jared who is a... Uh, just out uh, kid from Kansas who's just finding his voice as a queer. Wow. So his, his goal is to tell, now that he's out, his goal is to tell other positive sex, sex stories from the past. So yeah. he picks the, the embracing lovers and he goes back in time to find out who they were and brings his camera crew with them to record it so they can put it on television in two months. So that's the, that's, that's the concept. That's the high-end concept of allowing me to get in to the ancient past, tell a strong queer story, but also have the comedic element of a modern-day film crew squabbling and using drones over Vesuvius. You know, so. Oh, my gosh. But, but that's, the way we, that's the way humans learn, right? Yeah. It's story. It's allegory. That's why we have mythology. Yeah. Oh, and, hope, and hopefully if somebody reads the book and then they're fascinated by Rome, they're fascinated by gay culture. And there's a lot of different ways in. You can come in as a gay reader. You can come in as someone who loves ancient history, someone who loves fantasy or ancient Rome. And hopefully all the other elements blend and you might be more curious about some of the other things. Mm-hmm. In there. So hopefully it's a way to bring people into the tent and let them decide where they want to go from there. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I think that's great. I I think the o- almost the only way to tell real stories is through it's through story. That came out sort of dumb. Is to tell like a personal story. Like you can talk about history and go, yes, in 17, whatever we did. So there, this was signed and that was really just peachy. But if you tell the story of people, yeah, humans story. hear that. Characters. It's all about characters. Yeah. That's why we're still reading the Iliad or whatever all these days. We don't right. it's not people care about a Bronze Age war because they care about Achilles and Patroclus and this love yes. affair. And that's why we keep going back right. to that. Well, it's characters. Yeah. I don't know anybody who says, I can't wait. You, I can't you wait. You use to the word mythology to describe it. Nobody says that. <laughs> no, but you, you had used the word mythology actually when we talked about. Uh, the Stonewall riots. And I thought that was fascinating because it's like, yeah, that's becoming mythology. It's long and enough it's now where once people start dying off. And again, I've met people who've been there or they say they were there. You never know. There's your mythology at work. Yeah. You know, I live in New York and, you know, um, Stonewall was probably just, you know, two miles that way across the river. Oh, my gosh. Cool. So, you know, yeah. I'm right there in the thick of it and people talk about it. But again, as, as people get older, they start to talk about it. They die off. It becomes a different thing. And I, I think we have to yeah. recognize that's why we need histories. And, and that's why we need I, taking back to my documentary stuff. I'm, you know, not only am I talking to, about if I'm talking about ancient history, I'm talking about the guy who's digging at Babylon and what it's like for him to go to Babylon after the Iraq war and be the first person in there and try to store stuff up. So I'm getting his history, too. I'm getting his story. It's the people that yeah. are passionate about the history that actually is spending their life sometimes in dangerous situations trying to do something. So documentary isn't just droning on about 
ancient Babylon, in my films, I like to bring in the archaeologist and the and the and the experts who are passionate about it and want to save it or whatever, because then people right. can relate. Then if you're watching a television at home, you don't care about Hammurabi. You may care about Joe Johnson, the archaeologist, who you know quit school to go over there and dig. Yes. <laughs> Right. Oh my gosh. That was a great way to put that. So can we, so can you tell us quickly where, how we can find Neil Laird on the, on the internet? On the internet, the the magical internet. (laughs) Uh, My books are on Amazon. So if you're interested in primetime travelers, which is already out and then primetime Pompeii, which soon comes out, maybe by the time this airs, um, Amazon, you go to Amazon, look for Neil Laird or just put, put in, um, go to Amazon primetime travelers and it pops up. Okay. And then on my website, you can join my mailing list, neolaird.com. And then I, I give out free short stories and you can, and, and, you know, you can get free copies, advanced copies of my books to give reviews or talk about it. So that, and then gay history, which I haven't worked on in a while, but those are short stories I have about famous gays through ancient history that I like to talk to people about. Little short videos from everybody from, as I mentioned, Richard the Lionhearted to um, Alexander the Great and talk about, you know, yeah. the stories they had. All right. Cool. So, okay. So I have, I have links here to your website, LinkedIn, Facebook, and TikTok. And so you can follow Neil on all those places. That's awesome. Uh, All right. Well, Neil, I definitely want to say, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll do my little wrap up here. Um, Say thank you to our listeners. Definitely. And uh, let's see. I am Amethyst Herrick. I was speaking with Neil Laird on Gender Identity Weekly about uh, primetime travelers gay history, and of course, why we always need history. So thank you again, Neil. Much appreciated. My pleasure.